want to create environments where all of our students can learn and succeed. One way we can do this is through being aware of and addressing the issue of stereotype threat. So let's talk about where we might come up against stereotype threat. The idea of stereotype threat is the three following conditions have to exist. First, a negative stereotype has to exist about a social group. And the members of that social group need to be aware of the stereotype. And then when stereotype threat comes into play is when the social group members are being asked to perform in an area where the stereotype is relevant. For example, when women are asked to perform in STEM classes, or black students are given tests framed as intelligence assessments, or when elderly adults are given memory tests. These are all examples that fit the idea of stereotype threat. Stereotype threat was really first studied by Claude Steele, but it has been really extensively studied since then, and a lot of the work has been pretty fascinating. There will be some links in the notes on this video, and I encourage you to check those out and explore deeper. Stereotype threat is found mostly on tasks that are a little difficult or at the upper levels of someone's ability. It doesn't tend to be relevant on tasks that are easy for the participant to do. A little bit about these two pathways. In the internalization pathway, what happens is that the individual first internalizes the stereotype and then they don't work as hard because they feel that that way they will not confirm the stereotype because they never work to their full capacity. An externalization pathway happens when someone already expects others to hold negative stereotypes and make judgments about them and they develop anxiety about performing badly in front of those who have those judgments. That creates a performance burden which then undermines their achievement. Some things that happen as a result of stereotype threat. One is that people become afraid to ask for help because they are afraid that if they ask for help, they'll be perceived as not belonging. For example, college students who are facing stereotype threat might feel that they, don't, they will be seen as not belonging in college. Similarly, they may just not participate. Or underperformance can come up, again, for reasons we'll talk about, but largely because there's a certain burden on the student as a result of feeling that they're being judged due to the stereotype. And then working memory depletion, which we'll talk more about on the next slide. So in a situation where the negative stereotype is relevant, this triggers a physiological stress response and monitoring processes, efforts by the individual to suppress negative thought processes as well. All of this obviously takes attention away from and concentration away from the task at hand and it leads to a reduction in working memory necessary for successful performance and learning. There are a lot of consequences about this. There are a lot of consequences from this. One is that um, this reduced working memory significantly impacts test scores. Also, in general, stereotype threat leads to diminished self-confidence and decreased enjoyment in the learning process or activity involved. The students or individuals involved can feel an undermined sense of belonging. And actually, it's been shown that especially among um, black individuals, stereotype threat has led to an increased vulnerability to hypertension. Some interesting quotes for you. Stereotype threat may impair learning and knowledge acquisition. Stereotype threat was found to interfere with encoding material, summarizing and evaluating information, the comprehension of values, and the use of efficient strategies. I wanted to include this quote because a lot of the work that's done and a lot of the discussion that happens focuses primarily on testing and high stakes testing. But there's reason to believe that learning in general is impacted by stereotype threat, and I'm sure you can imagine how that could come into play in your classroom. Another quote from Nicole Johnson of Horlow. Not much work has been conducted on stereotype threat in relation to degree completion, but its disruption of academic performance definitely runs counter to progress toward a degree. Think about that for a second. We're very concerned about our students completing their degrees, and at the moment, if we don't address stereotype threat, it puts our students at risk of being unable to complete their degrees. Continuing with the quote, having to navigate the constant question of whether or not they belonged in college was described by the students to be a heavy burden. Ultimately, participants began to detail the threat by confirming the racial stereotypes held against them. This is in relation to a study that was done using qualitative data and surveys of students at four-year colleges. We can hope that at our college, we're making students feel welcome and not as though they don't belong. But this is something we really need to focus on and encourage our colleagues to work toward so that we can make sure our students don't face this heavy burden. Stereotype threat not only increases sensitivity to mistakes, it also increases sensitivities to one's own internal states. Most people assume that they feel anxious when things aren't going well, and so anxiety itself during a performance can readily be interpreted as evidence of failure. Just think about that for 
a moment. If you assume that you're feeling anxious because you're not doing well, that will definitely impact your overall performance. And if you're in an anxious state because of stereotype threat, you will feel as though you must not be doing well at the task. I wanted to talk about latent ability effect. It's just interesting to note that according to Walton, in an environment in which stereotype threat has been reduced, members of a negatively stereotyped group outperform non-stereotyped groups. And this has been shown through a variety of means. Again, check out those studies linked at the end. People who tend to be the highest achieving and care the most are also the most affected by negative stereotypes. So what does that mean? If my identity, let's say as a math person is very important to me, then I will be much more impacted as a woman by a negative stereotype about women and mathematics than someone who's a woman but doesn't care about their ability at mathematics. Second quote here, people tend to be more invested in the evaluative implications of their performance to the extent that the stigmatized identity is central to their self-concept. Again, the same idea. I will be more invested in and think that my performance reflects on my identity as a mathematician if my identity as a woman who does math is important to me. Let's now talk about some coping strategies. First of all, practicing test problems so that they go to the long-term memory instead of working memory is important because remember, stereotype threat impacts working memory. So if we can help students move the information into their long-term memory, then even if their working memory is impacted, they should still be able to recall the information. Self-affirmation is where you might ask the students to affirm an important value or positive attribute prior to taking a test or completing a writing assignment. There have been some studies about something similar called values affirmation. These have had mixed results, but it's an easy activity and some people have found it positive, so if you find a way to work it into your classes, you might choose to do so. To perform values affirmation, you just ask students to identify values that are important to them and write about how they incorporate those values into their lives. You have them do it a couple of times during the term, maybe at the beginning and then again before midterms, with the understanding that the instructor isn't going to read Also, mindfulness training has been shown to be very effective. Probably this isn't something you can incorporate into your class, although maybe depending on what you teach, but it's something that perhaps at an institutional level could be useful. And then teaching students strategies to aid in suppressing anxious thoughts can be useful, although if a student becomes really aware of that and working hard at suppressing their anxious thoughts, then of course the risk is that that further impacts their working memory. Similarly, This last point I've read, but I think it's important to consider a side note. One recommendation is to educate students about stereotype threat and then acknowledge that the stereotype is not legitimate. The issue there has to do with something called priming. There have been several studies that have shown that students underperform after priming the stereotype. So what that means is, for example, by asking students to identify their ethnicity or gender, that primes them to be thinking about their ethnicity or gender, which then can impact them on a test when they're under stereotype threat. So definitely the second part of that, acknowledging that the stereotype is illegitimate, is important. And I would say that I think timing is crucial. That is, perhaps you wouldn't want to do that right before giving a high stakes test or exam. Another thing we can do is to create identity safe environments. And one of the main things we can do there is just to assure individuals that their identities are not a barrier to success. You can also facilitate positive contacts between students who are experiencing stereotype threat and members of the dominant group. If you can have a social group member administer a test, for example, if you're administering standardized tests, you might wish to consider who administers the test. That can help as well. And then making sure that you use role models showing successful members of the social identity group can be a great way to create an identity safe environment. Now there are a lot of recommendations for educators and since most of us watching this are educators, I'll make sure that we go through all of these. Obviously some of them are the things I just mentioned, fostering identity safe environments and teaching students about stereotype threat and the illegitimacy of stereotypes regarding ability. Similarly to the previous point, encouraging students to see abilities as malleable rather than innate is really important because it helps students get away from the idea that one group of people is innately good or bad at a particular task or subject. Again, using role models of successful group members can be very valuable, and making sure you communicate to your students that they're welcomed and valued. Making all of the students in your class feel like they belong there is important. Trying to help your students disengage their self-worth from their performance feedback can be important too, so that they don't consider doing poorly on a test or assignment as an indicator of their worth as a person or their ability to perform well in that area. Some research has shown that participants, some research has shown that participants benefited less from feedback if they were suspicious of a negative stereotype from the person giving the feedback. And that's why 
it has been suggested that possibly computer-assisted instruction and feedback can improve benefits from feedback. If you can de-emphasize the potentially threatened identities, that's another thing you can do. And removing items from the room that suggest situational cues and emphasize feelings of not belonging. For example, if you're teaching a math class, having your classroom full of extremely masculine slash nerdy material might emphasize stereotype threat for some female class participants. I wanted to include this quote here from Apple and Kronberger. Any special treatment by a teacher for members of a stereotyped group that is not based on a systematic effort to reduce inequalities, but rather based on a spontaneous impulse, likely increases stereotype threat. So you may have the impulse to give certain students benefits or treat them differently, but that will actually emphasize to them their difference from the rest of the class. Another thing you can do is altering the description of a test or task. For example, if you are giving a test to a group of elderly individuals, you might start by saying that it's not a test of cognitive ability or memory. Guiding students to see themselves as composed of multiple roles and identities can also help, and so can showing intellectual performance as something that can grow over time. Finally, emphasizing that you have high standards and you believe that students can achieve them has been shown to greatly reduce the effect of stereotype threat. As I said before, there have been a number of fascinating studies on stereotype threat and how it impacts all kinds of performance in many different arenas. And while in some areas the results have been questioned. When it comes to education, the research has been fairly unequivocal. This is a real issue, and it's one we can all work on together to help improve students' experience and make sure every student can be successful in our classes.